Uh, I'd like to begin today by thanking Hans and Gulchen for having me back to this most remarkable series of conferences in, in this very beautiful hotel here in beautiful Bodrum. And I hope that you're all having as good a time here as I am. Now, I've been asked to talk about financial markets in the ancient world. And I think it's rather a pop article, and I wouldn't want to be unduly excited. My answer is that there were financial markets in the ancient world. They were not as developed and as sophisticated as our own financial markets, but they were recognizably financial markets. That being said, I now want to turn to the nature and interpretation of the evidence of existence of financial markets. Now, if you want to talk about um, English and Dutch market civilization in the 17th and 18th centuries, there is a vast mass of information about those. Uh, if you want to talk about economic structures, there are newspapers, there are contemporary analyses, but there is no doubt that England and Holland in the 17th and 18th centuries were market societies. If you want to construct a sequential table of uh, wheat prices and day labor and wages in England, you can do that from 1250 onwards. There is the data. When we turn to the ancient world, when we turn to Greece and Rome, uh, the information is for the most part not available. It's not available for a number of reasons. One of the reasons is that the ancients did not share our interest in statistics, that they did not, at least they did not seem to have uh, collected the kind of data that we take for granted. Um, they also did not follow through to keep it. We're not sure, for example, that the Roman government knew the actual population of Rome. It, it knew the number of taxpayers in Rome, it knew the number of taxpaying households in a particular city. But the idea of collecting statistics uh, broken down by age and sex and class does not appear to have entered their minds. Uh, certainly, um, they were far less interested than we are in things like uh, money supply figures, um, birth, deaths, and marriages, um, trade statistics, and all the other things that we have. We may be poor, we may be poor, we may be poor, use which they're put, but at least we do have these, and the ancients do not appear even to have tried to collect them. But there is then the problem that. Most of the literary evidence of the ancient world has just disappeared. Uh, their civilization did collapse in the 5th and 7th centuries, and a vast mass of literature, which had been preserved until then pretty well, just disappeared. If you look at the great historians of Rome, Livy and Tacitus, we have only large fragments of their works. And um, what we have has been mediated through various populists of the Middle Ages who were not terribly interested in economic questions. Indeed, the ancient writers themselves were all snobbish. They were just not interested in, in discussing the things which we often regard as all consuming interest. And so there is a shortage of hard evidence on which to base any conclusions. We then have the nature of how the evidence is interpreted. Now, you may assume, and I'll say more about this in a minute, you may assume that ancient societies were not societies rather like ours. They were not so rich, they had the institution of slavery, and they were very high in information and transport. Possibly speaking, they were much the same as we are. However, within classical studies during the past 50 years, an often dominant tradition has emerged in which it is simply denied that ancient societies were not societies. Um, 
the two most important writers of the tradition are a Hungarian called Karl Holland, I believe is the pronunciation, though in English speaking the world, we would simply call him Karl Holland, and the, um, the historian Moses Finney. Let me turn first to Holland, writing in the 1940s. He says, the concept of the market economy was born with the French physiocrats simultaneously with the emergence of the institution of the market as a supply and demand price mechanism. This was, in the course of time, followed by the revolutionary innovation of markets with fluctuating prices for the tax of production, labor, and land. Uh, he also says that prior to our own time, prior to the world of about 1800 onwards, no economy has ever existed that even in principle was controlled by markets. Gain and profit, made or exchange, never before the 19th century played an important part in human economy. Now that is a rather bold statement, as I said earlier, we may reject it flatly. In fact, I'm sure we do reject it flatly. But this has become dominant within large parts of classical studies and ancient studies. Um, what Holland says is that instead of being based on a set of market transactions, the ancient economy um, was, was based on something else. And what was said is the outstanding discovery of recent historical and anthropological research is that man's economy, as a rule, is submerged in his social relationships. He does not act so as to safeguard his individual interests in the possession of material goods. He acts as to safeguard his actual standing, his social claims, his social assets. He values material goods only insofar as they serve that end. In place of market behavior, Pollard said, that ancient or other pre-modern civilizations were based on the two principles of reciprocity and redistribution. Reciprocity means that um, you have a community in which one person specializes in making pockets, another person specializes in making carpets, somebody else in hunting, somebody else in growing cabbages, and these people exchange products without prices and without any thought of making a profit, with no thought of it as a vulgar as material gain. Uh, what they are doing is producing because they feel it is their social duty to do so. Uh, and they exchange because that also is their social duty. Uh, redistribution means that um, a harvest or the gains of foreign trade or, or any other particular service is gathered in, uh, by a centre, it may be a state, it may be a priest, a priesthood or an aristocracy, and is then redistributed among the people on the basis of uh, merit or need. And there may be prices in this kind of system, but they are prices which simply uh, indicate equivalences of value so that goods can be distributed. Uh, for example, uh, five cabbages may equal one chicken, which is quite useful to know if you're distributing these things so that one person gets five cabbages and another person gets one chicken and uh, nobody feels left out. The idea that the prices are formed by the twin forces of supply and demand, and if there's any change in supply and demand, prices change, that, that's an impossibility. That, that simply doesn't happen. Uh, now, Colorado did the same thing yesterday. That, that there was trade, there was trade in the ancient world, but trade usually took place at courts of trade which were very heavily insulated from the um, territorial king's land, so that no information about prices could move from one to the other. And again, the prices at these ports of trade were mostly um, set by treaty uh, between the um, various, uh, various trading powers. 
Again, there is no thought that uh, scarcity should enter into the price or that the uh, relative valuation of the goods should enter into the formation of the price. And um, Polanyi spoke, Polanyi wrote mostly about the societies of the ancient Near East, Egypt, Sumeria, Babylonia, and so on. Um, and summarizing the research, he says, even in highly stratified archaic societies, such as Sumeria, Babylonia, and Syria, the Hittites, or Egypt, storage economies prevailed, and in spite of a large scale use of money and the standard, it used for indirect exchange of paper. This may incidentally explain the complete lack of points in the great civilizations of Babylonia and Egypt. Okay, so you have a flat denial of market activity in, in the civilizations of the past. Now, why should this be important? Because it's important to us that wrong, but it's also important to us because it may be seen as part of the same corrosive attack on market civilization as we've seen from the Marxists and uh, more particularly recently from the post-Marxists. There are a number of ways in, in which you attack market civilization. And one of the most big ways in which you attack it is by saying that it is not a natural institution. We, as libertarians and conservatives, usually have at the back of our mind the notion that market behavior is part of human nature. So long as you do not have a grossly extended and grossly oppressive state, or an absolutely stultifying set of religious or cultural traditions, market behavior is what people do. Uh, now, it doesn't mean that every time the government leaves people alone, we become Americans. Uh, as David Hume said a few hundred years ago, the Rhine flows to the north, the Rhone flows to the south. But uh, water is all, water always runs down because of the forces of gravity. Um, market behavior can be different in each society based on the intellectual and moral capacities of people, and also based on their prior um, cultural and religious tradition. But nevertheless, market activity is what people do naturally. That's what we believe. And it also seems to be what most other people believe. The, the idea that something is natural is an enormous argument of entertainment in our society. If you argue, for example, that uh, a family is a natural institution, that to a certain extent legitimizes the family. If you argue that slavery is an unnatural institution, that also to a certain extent delegitimizes slavery. It doesn't mean that slavery, once you argue that it's unnatural, um, is immediately abolished because you can perhaps put up arguments on the basis of its great utility or on the basis of its non cultural acceptance. But the moment you argue that something is natural, you raise a presumption in its favor, and when you argue that it's unnatural, you raise a presumption against it. And so part of our argument in favor of markets is that they are part of a natural order. And here you have a dominant tradition within classical scholarship saying that market behavior is not natural. Market behavior is something which has emerged in the pre in the past 200 years. It is a passing phase. Now, Polari was a socialist. Uh, a relatively uh, radical socialist, and he, he disliked market civilization. He, um, he regarded markets as immoral and unjust. And his wife says of him, it is given to the best of our things somewhere to let down the roots of a sacred hate in the course of their lives. This happened to Polar in England. At later stages in the United States, it really grew in intensity. His hatred was directed against market society and its effects, which divested men of his human shape. Uh, speaking more bluntly, Polanyi says, 
In order to comprehend German fascism, we must revert to Ricardian influence. <laughs> now, again, you may say, well, okay, so that's the news that's still all about it. If you can argue that there was no market activity among the Aztecs, some aren't done, but no, they aren't done. After all, um, the Aztecs were people famous for ritual torture, mass human sacrifice, cannibalism. They had the writing, they did not have the use of metals, they didn't even seem to get anything from people. Um, you can hardly actually say that this was a civilization. And the other civilizations or the other cultures in South America will remain even better. The Spanish conquest was, in own terms, a remarkably brutal operation, but you might argue that in the long term, the Spanish did a considerable benefit to the people of South America by conquering them and converting them to Seattle. Uh, but when you say this of the ancient civilizations of the Middle East, you know, and when you say it of the Greeks and Romans, it is certainly another matter. Because the Greeks and Romans are at the heart of our civilization. They are the foundations on which we built. We may be Turkish Muslims, we may be German barbarians from the north, we may be Italians and Spanish and Greeks and French. Our ancestors may have helped to destroy the civilization, they have helped to preserve it. But in all senses, the Greeks and the Romans are the foundation of our civilization where we stand now. And if you can argue that the Greeks and Romans did not have, did not know market behavior in the sense that we do, then it does, in a certain sense, undercut our claim that market behavior is natural. It is natural. It is part of human nature. And so this is the debate that's been going on for 50 years. Um, the Polari and the Muslim tradition, as I said, uh, said the third time, is dominant in certain areas. And so it is of some importance to us as conservative and libertarian activists and scholars uh, to be aware of all this debate and, and to know exactly how we should move it. Uh, and now you cannot simply say, oh, market behavior is theologically part of human nature, therefore, for our infinity of God, there are this is to say, you know, this is economic solipsism, um, or the last part of what's called it false consciousness, or gradually called a discourse. You have been so conditioned by your circumstances that you are unable to conceive of anything other than the uh, world in which you live. Uh, and so your argument that market behavior is part of human nature, therefore there was market behavior, May not be perfectly valid, but it will be rejected by these people. Uh, so, so, what you could do is you could look at the definitions of market economy given by Polari and Finn. Uh, and then there was something better grounds because these people seem to assume that unless you have um, a going gold comfort kind of economy, or, or at least the kind of economy that you see described in Paul Sanderson's uh, famous textbook. Is not a market economy. If you can show any degree of uh, reciprocity and redistribution, therefore it's not a market economy, therefore Polari and to as you said, did make must be right. And of course, that's a ridiculous definition. Um, one England and one America. I don't deny that the market economy is, but something like half the three quarters of the transactions in those countries take place outside the market. My wife. I'm the jacket for me earlier, should not be paid for it. I, I change my water so nappies. I, I don't um, keep a towel. Um, friends who favors the people, relatives who favors the people, we give to charity. Uh, large organizations, large companies, quite often the transactions with a loan to take place at zero price or at prices set for the person who limited convenience. You will, in a more economy, see an enormous amount of reciprocity and even that sense, a great deal of redistribution. And so, Polari and Finley are wrong, uh, simply by definition of a market economy. 
Uh, if you try to apply their categories to modern England, modern America, you could say that there are different types of Sumerians and Egyptians, which would be a plain absurdity. But um, you know, these are also the questions of evidence. And um, as I said, the problem with evidence from ancient societies is that most of it has disappeared. It's rather, imagine a mosaic, a very beautiful mosaic, which had been broken up and was the tile thrown away. You have a few tensions here and there, a great mass of tiles, and you must somehow reconstruct the whole from the fragments of the parts that are there. It, it is difficult to do, but it can be done with some certainty. And in my view, the most exciting. Um, work on, a, uh, on ancient coins has not been done by a classicist, but by an economist called Morris Silver, who does not appear to know any of the specific languages, but does show some familiarity with Greek and Latin. Uh, Morris Silver published his first article on the subject in the German Economic History in 1983. And when I read this uh, a little while ago, I want to shout with laughter. It is a 37 page point by point demolition of a column. It takes every piece of evidence adduced by these people against citizens of markets and shows that it is in fact evidence for markets. Uh, let me read you the abstracts to this article. This essay challenges Karl Kohlan's position that ancient Near Eastern economies use state and temporary administration, but not price paying markets. It is found that the prerequisite functions of the market economy listed by Colony, the allocation of consumer goods, land, and labor to the supply demand price mechanism, risk bearing organized as a market function, and loan markets, were all present in the ancient Near East. Although Colony criticized stage theories for their privilege and the continuity, he imposed his own notion of continuity of history in London together many thousands of years under the rubric of archaic society. This perspective prevents them from recognizing that ancient Mesopotamia experienced lengthy and significant periods of unfettered market activity, as well as periods of pervasive state regulation. Um, I recommend you go and find the article and to read for service. It also expanded into the book published in 1995, which is also well worth getting out and reading. And so, um, Morris Silver shows that there was market activity in the ancient Near East. And uh, so let's see what evidence there might be for market activity in history and Roman civilization. Now, I don't want to ask about the so I'll use one example. From Aristotle Politics, Book 1, Section 9. Uh, it's an anecdote of um, Thales of Miletus, who lived just down the road from us. Um, according to the story, by his skills in the stars while it was in winter, but there would be a great harvest of olive oil in the coming year. So, having a little money, he gave deposits for the use of all the oil presses in Kios and Miletos, which he hired at a low price because no one would get into. When the harvest time came and many were worked, many were worked for at once and at sudden, he let them out at any rate he pleased and they were the money. Now, Finley would say, oh, that's an example of credit capital, but it's not actual market activity, you know, it's political stuff. But hang on, look at it. Um, what you have here is an example of a contract. And it may not be a true story, but it was Aristotle writing in Athens, and Aristotle and his readers appear to be familiar with the idea of. Um, putting down deposits for the future use of economic resources. Indeed, Aristotle says that nobody else did against companies. And so, companies did not think of four markets and go around and make any profit from them. He took advantage of a pre existing market structure. It seems to be quite normal for uh, the use of oil presses to be rented out months, so perhaps even a year in advance. There was auction. Nobody else did against him. He made these contracts, which meant that there was a legal system which was accustomed to dealing with contracts. 
uh, and maybe contracts in the expectation that they would be influenced by the colonists. And um, you make those contracts with people who appear to get them. Um, Faris put down the pocket, he didn't uh, put full money down, it was, uh, it was an option. He made these contracts, and then the harvest time came around. You didn't have an enraged community taking these oil crests from them and using them for their aggressive, reciprocal, or redistributive economic activity. No, uh, they went to the army and said, please, can we can use some oil crests? And we were going to have it for 20 little balls of food or something. And he made money from this. But now, as I said, ancient, the evidence for ancient economic activity is all of its nature. It's anecdotal schools, which may be true, may be false. But in the false story, it is useful. It, it's useful to show the assumptions of the people um, among whom the story first circulated. Uh, you, you have a few pieces of testers about uh, a major financial crisis in Rome in 33 AD, which does show that there was a, a strong linkage of capital and land markets. Interest rates only shot up, the price of land collapsed, and uh, this crisis was only lifted when the emperor lent 100 million sesterces interest rate for three years, and that the Austrians are not in the same way. So they steal the financial crisis. But you know, even a wrong kind of theory um, gives some indication that people were willing to think about economics and that they want an economy to think about. Um, so, in conclusion, I would say there do appear to have been financial markets in the ancient world, but much more important than that. There were the market margins. The Greeks and Romans were the richest we are, but if you know anything we do, they had a grossly imperfect numbering system. Information costs were staggering high, and transport costs also made trade prohibitive uh, beyond three miles inland from the train. But there could be no reasonable doubt that these were market economies in the sense that we would recognize, and in the sense that people analyzed using the um, standard mechanisms of um, uh, of like free point theory. And I would again suggest that this is not an obscure debate of academics in a subject of which you may have little knowledge and in which you have little interest. This is a very important debate because if the Korahi and, and, and Finn thesis about ancient economies continues to dominate classical studies, there is one more large island or the content of socialism in the universities. Very few people may read the stuff, but generation after generation students are exposed to it. And millions of people are exposed to it uh, indirectly through films, television documentaries, newspaper articles, and so on. And because of the enormous prestige of the Greeks and Romans, um, any evidence regarding their behavior does have some persuasive value among us. Um, so if you are interested in following this debate any further, a good place to start is that article um, on my website, which, as I said, contains all citations and a great deal more information I've given you to start with. And uh, that being said, I've had my 30 minutes. I'd like to thank you for your great indulgence and um, thank you, Hans and George. Thank <laughs> you.